Chapter 7 is in regards to global stratification. When we're looking at from a global stratification, your, your opening chapter talks about two different types of lifestyles. One is a family, a 33-year-old male and his wife, who is 28, who has you know a family of seven who struggles to avoid the starvation. Um, actually, they have seven children, so they're a total family of nine. They live in this 320 square foot, you know, um, basically plaster huts with no electricity, gas, water, and all that aspects. Kind of the scenario I just gave you is the picture that you guys are seeing as we're right now. Um, when you're looking at this, and we kind of take for granted in regards to what we have. So when we're looking at stratification wise in regards to the caste, the state, the class systems, the the including like the bond labor and all that aspects, we can kind of see that us as U.S. type aspects kind of take things a little for granted. You know, the other half of the opening vignette um, talked about a family that was in Illinois um, in regards to a husband and wife and their two kids who live in a four bedroom, two and a half bath, you know, tw almost 2,700 square feet, you know, have running water, electricity, all the materialistic things, cars, this, that, and the other. Um, you know, you can kind of see how it's really different in regards to when we're looking at it from a global stratification aspects in regards to um, why we have these layering of groups and people within the nation, right? Um, when we have those layers of um, groups of people within those nations, it's called social stratification. So it's basically, basically underneath the social stratification is a division of large number of people into layers according to their relative property, power, and prestige, okay? When we're talking about that, it's, it's just the, the number of aspects. When we're looking at it from a global aspects, you know, we are not ones that have to carry, you know, um, the wheat or any type of food or anything like that on our heads, water, that aspect. So we don't have to go fetch our food. Our food, we go just fetch it from a grocery store. A little different of an atmosphere in regards to how we, we look at their, you know, different levels of that property, power, and prestige type aspects. When we're looking at the aspects of from a slavery, um, when we're looking at from a caste system, a state system, a class system, all of these things have some type of a dynamic that kind of goes behind it. Um, when we're looking at from slavery, what were the causes of slavery? You know, it goes back to the time of, uh, you know, foundation of uh, the, you know, basically U.S. soils type aspects. You know, slavery was a condition. Um, there was, you know, some causes that caused slavery. Uh, back in the early 1700s, 1800s, slavery wasn't as strict and in, in underneath a lot of rules that it happened in about the mid to 1900s, of eight, mid 1800s to 1900s. The conditions of slavery took on the bad aspects, whereas, you know, the word slavery in the early 17, 1800s, the word slavery wasn't a really bad thing because they still had the equal rights. They were able to own land. They were still able to do natural things like marrying and all that aspects. There wasn't the segregation that it was in, in the the later 1800s until the 19 you know 1960s um, until the segregation of the Jim Crow law kind of went away. Um, but at the same time, when you're looking at those types of conditions, you know, does slavery still exist today? Yes. When you're looking at it from a global aspects, it is still a condition that still does exist. You've got human trafficking um, in some other parts of the other country. You know, um, slavery is still kind of considered, considered a highly run thing, um, but it is, you know, an aspects in regards to it. But in some cases, when we were talking about slavery, it's one of those aspects that it wasn't always a permanent thing. And sometimes it says slavery was temporary. It wasn't permanent. Um, they was, sometimes it might have been just for paying off a certain debt. And they were able to kind of go back and do what they were able to do. Um, if they were, you know, transferred of ownership type aspects, I mean, we're talking about people who we shouldn't be talking about them like their property. Um, or some type of an object, but at the same time, those were the types of conditions. They were transferred, they were moved. So, but in some instances, slavery was temporary. It was not permanent all the time. When we're looking at the bonded of labor type aspects in the world, bonded of labor is just the, the contractual system in which someone sells his or her body. You know, some people had that opportunity to do that themselves. They chose to do it. They could choose to do it. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's the, um, 
the aspects of people wanting to start a new life. So therefore they kind of sell themselves to kind of say, you know what, if I become part of your, you know, system or, you know, that type of ideology aspects, then, you know, they, they kind of do it themselves. So that's that bonded labor. When we're looking at slavery in the new world, you know, it's inheritable, some aspects. Um, babies born um, to slavery become the property of the slave owners. This was about in 1956 before the, like I said, the segregation law or before the Civil War type aspects laws kind of came into place. Um, but like I said, slavery today, it still exists in some aspects, some way. Um, you know, basically in like the Ivory Coast, Nigeria, um, long um, history of slavery that's in those areas until like the 1980s when slavery was illegal. Um, but then, like I said, it, it still, it takes sometimes a little bit longer for certain areas to pick up. Nigeria's slavery stopped in 2003. Um, where it still continues though, um, ISIS also practices slavery as well, which is after killing an adult man, you know, infidels, you know, that type of aspects, you know, human trafficking, uh, prisoner reports, stuff like that. The, it, those are slaveries in today's terms. It, it's like I said, it's something that still exists. It's just not known as the same as it had in the history of the past times. Um, but when we're looking at the um, early times, this is a, um, basically a advertisement propaganda more or less in regards to they try to make it look like a more of a bystanders but this was in the the 1800s like i said i would probably say about mid 1800s it was a poster from missouri um it, supposedly it went to a horse but no it was talking about if you read in here very very closely it says right here age five years old they're talking about a five-year-old little girl um, and they're trying to bypass it as a horse, you know, as a raffle type aspects. Um, so that was kind of like the slavery ideal back then. It was considered as like a big prize, you know, um, more or less of an object and not as a human being. When we're looking at the caste system, India's religious caste system is very in, uh, secure. It's in place. It has its points. Um, when you're looking at it, this is the caste system for India. Um, if you were in, you know, the Dalit caste system, this is the outcasters, the um, degrading or polluting the labor type aspects, you are to remain in this system. You are not to leave outside of this class system more or less, right? You are, you can't go and um, basically marry somebody that's in a higher elevation of it in this. Um, you are expected to stay in this caste system. You don't, um, you, you might cross paths with one of them, but at that, you know, um, in India's caste system, they, they made things very segregated, very separate to where certain times of the days, they're not allowed to integrate with one another. So this is kind of like part of everyday lifestyle aspects. Um, one of the pictures I showed you in the beginning of the two women holding the, um, grain and water on top of their head that's actually from India so that kind of gives you a little bit of an ideal in regards to kind of what they're expected um, in South Africa same thing they have a um, um, athoprite or upper, um, which is a government approved and enforced separation of racial ethnicity groups as part in South Africa they kind of have this caste system where they're um, European whites they're African blacks they're colors which is their mixed race and Asians they they separate them by these groups and the classifications determine where people would live work go to school you know those are considered caste systems and when we're looking at racial caste systems in the U.S. we kind of have these categories as well you know we we believe in the subject of a class system of a racial class system um, from the moment of birth race marks kind of everybody's lifestyles all whites even though they were poor you know, uneducated, they're still consider themselves as a higher status as anybody else. Um, but it's kind of one of those situations, it's kind of how history kind of has kind of led the fact in regards to how class systems or state systems are supposed to, to be caste systems. Um, after centuries of silence, women of India are daring to protest rape publicly. Um, this is a photo of students holding the candlelight march uh, was taken in India. But if you notice, if you look at this picture closely, you could kind of count on two hands on how many women are in this picture. 
so it's still very dominant man type aspects in regards to the caste system in regards for them to kind of moving out of that old history of you know if you fall in one of these categories this is the category you got to stay within um so when if you look at this like i said this caste system it was taken in march um i think it was in 2000 i want to say maybe 17 2015 um but at the same time it's one of those situations to where they're starting to break their old habits um they're starting to break those traditional aspects that used to be in place for a long long length of time when we're looking at the estate aspects, you kind of have to look at the estate certification as a medieval European type aspects. There's three groups that go with this medieval time contract, you know, um, con consisting of basically three groups. Let me rephrase that. Um, you have the nobility, you have the clergy, and you have commoners, right? When you're looking at the nobility, this is considered the first class. These are your first elites, um, which are the wealthy families who rule the countries. Um, they own the land, which was a source of the wealth. At the time, the, the nobility did no farming themselves or any work. The, you know, you kind of look at them as like the leaders, the kings and queens type aspects. Those are the nobilities. Well, the second estate, which is the clergy, these are the Roman Catholic Church, was a political power at the time. They own vast amounts of land and collect taxes from everyone who live within those boundaries and parish. Um, the church powers, uh, which had the great order, basically boundary, boundaries of those parish. They, they were the ones that kind of ordered the, who was crowned as king and queen and the obligations that kind of went with those permissions as well. And then you have your third estate, which is considered a commoners, which are also known as serfs. Uh, they belong to the land. Um, so if someone bought or inherited the land, the serfs came with it. Um, so basically the workers of them. And then when you're born into that third estate, they they died within it as well. They weren't able to move around within it. Uh, you know, when you're looking at the women within the estates, the women belong to the estates of their husbands. So women in the first our first estate had no occupation because in the case of her husband, physical work wasn't considered, you know, beneath their dignity type aspects. If you were a clergy of a of a man that was part of the clergy then you were expected to kind of you know rule along with your husband in regards to the aspects and same with the commoners if you you know were born you know obviously you wed within the commoners therefore you remain with the commoners and it's just kind of one of those things to where it was that aspects when you're looking at the clergy they never they did not marry that that rule still applied back during that time as well but you know when you had a woman in that estate aspects you know they may have never married but you still have women who were nuns during that time so that's kind of the aspects that the the woman took underneath the clergy aspects so when you're looking at this estate certification of the medieval time know all three of them um in regards to it so you need to know the nobility the clergy and the commoners know that they, those are all part of the estate certification of the medieval european time frames when you're looking at class, it's a little bit more open on the United States side, right? We have the possibility of social mobility. We have the option. We have the option ourselves to kind of move up and down, right? We have a class system. It's a form of social certification based primarily on income, education, and occupational prestige. It's all it basically is. I mean, if you have income, if you have education, and you have your occupational prestige, we can move up and down the mobility of the ladder. We could move up down um, the social class ladder that's not an issue that's not a problem when we're looking at the early industrialization children work alongside of adults we didn't have that flexibility back in the earlier industrial times right um, the the kids work 12 hour days monday through friday 15 hour days on saturday often in dangerous filthy conditions um, we've seen several photos by now throughout all this so this is, was taken in west virginia in 1908 um, if you notice, this child doesn't even stand up straight. He slouched. Um, the way how the working conditions were, um, the children were used to go into the dangerous mine situations to where adult men couldn't fit. Um, the kids were able to get into those small, tighter areas to put the dynamite in there for the explosions and stuff like that. So, But they worked just as much. They got paid just as much. And I've asked this question before. How would you feel in today's time, would you feel with a kid working right alongside of you, pulling the exact same amount of hours and doing the exact same work that you do. 
it had a little bit of a demeaning type aspects because now it's like, okay, well, my job really doesn't mean nothing. Um, so it's kind of one of those situations where you kind of have to look at it as a class system now, a social mobility type aspects. She's why now the, the child laws are, child labor laws are in place to where no kid could work at a certain age and stuff like that. <clears throat> when we're looking at a, a global certification aspects of a um, status of a female, gender is bias of social certification. Um, this is the case all over the world. Women are expect to you know, stay within their, their guidelines, you know, it's, it's a system of social um, aspects underneath the slavery, the caste, the state, or even class. All these systems are based on their gender. People are sorted into categories. Um, they're given a different access of good and available of their society. Um, about two thirds are women within these, some of these societies. Um, and because of gender, there's really, not an equal type of aspects when we're looking at the global aspects you know in some countries in some cultures you still have the men being very dominant women very being very submissive and kind of have to just follow the orders of whatever the man wants so when we're talking about social certification it's still very biased in regards to that aspects underneath gender when we're looking at super class Super class is one of those situations to where the richest thousand have more wealth than about 2.5 billion poorest people. They're almost all white, almost all are males, unless that they are wives of it or a daughter of somebody that they may have inherited them funds from. Um, when you're looking at the super class, there's only about a total of 6,000 members of the global super class. Um, they are they're the elites of all the elites. We learn more about these in chapter 11, but just to kind of give you this global super class in regards to the, how much wealth they actually have, you can kind of see here that the wealthiest 10% of adults worldwide, here's your, you know, worldwide 10%, they own 86% of the earth's wealth. So that 10% own 86% of the earth's wealth. If you want to take the 1% of the adults worldwide, the wealthiest 1%, they own almost half, 46% of first wealth. So if you can see the small difference, you have this little small 1% owns just as much as 10% does. So that special dominant distribution of basically that wealth, it's in regards to the wealthiest people, those power release type aspects. How do we determine social class? Karl Marx had the, the lovely means of production. This is the basically the ones who own the tools, the factories, the lands, um, investment capitals use their used to produce the wealth. Those were the means of production. He said, you know, in order to do this, you have to have this. And if you means of production, then you were considered Burgundese. Burgundese is basically a capitalist. So those are the ones who own the means of production. So in other words, the ones who own the tools, the factories, the land, you know, the investment capitals, they were the capitalists. They had control. They made the decisions. Um, and then he's like, well, then, you know, he had a term for basically just the mass of workers, and those were the proterialites. Uh, those were the ones that, you know, are your common um, who don't own the means of production. In other words, they don't own land, they don't own tools, they don't own any type of factories or anything like that. They were just your plain old workers. Um, people's relationship to the means of production determines their social class. So the more that you own, the more of the higher social class that you were. And if you had it all, then you were considered the capitalist, you were the elite type aspects. He also came up with a term called class consciousness. He used this class consciousness to refer to the awareness of a common identity based on one's position and means of production, um, which is the shared identity based on the relationship. Um, in other words, it was one of those not perceived themselves as exploited workers who's, you know, had the chance of kind of moving around. Um, he said, you know, the 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 proterialites that kind of had this intervention called the saw the future of the of the forecast of like you know what eventually i'll own that land and that type of aspects he called it as basically like a class consciousness like people kind of knew where they belonged um some people had this false class consciousness which is a term that refers to workers identity with the interests of a capitalist so those workers that had this you know back 
the the workers that had this identity of like oh i'm gonna become a capitalist i'm gonna work they said that they had the false consciousness but the class consciousness was basically the identity based on one's position and the means of production that was uh, marx's used term that just referred to the awareness of the common identity when you're looking at weber's perspective weber said okay that's cool but you know we kind of need a combination here we need a combination of property and power or we need a combination of property and prestige um, in order to say that you have this prestige type aspects or you have this wealth or you have this you know upper class type aspects so in order to do it they said well you kind of have to have two to kind of give you one so if you have property and power or excuse me property and prestige then you have power um, or if you have power, you have property and prestige, vice versa. If you have property, then you have power and prestige. If you have prestige, then you have property and power. You have to come in a, combine these in order to, which Weber said, in order to lead to other components of social classes. Um, he said you couldn't have just one. You kind of had to have both um, to kind of make sure that you had that wealthy and powerful, that prestigeness, that type of aspects in regards to saying you had that social class status. <clears throat> they also um, looked at why you know social stratification is universal why do we why do we think it's universal so from a functionalist point of view they had motivating qualified people um, they looked at it from uh, Davis and Moore explanations they looked at it as said okay there's two functionalists basically Davis and Moore they wanted to wrestle with this question and they kind of concluded that stratification of uh, society is it's going to happen regardless um, one for society to function its positions must be filled in other words there has to be a purpose for somebody right um, if somebody's position um, isn't filled you got to fill it um, some positions are more important than others that was the other one they kind of came up with the third one was is that more important positions must be filled by more qualified people and the motive for the the qualified people to fill these positions must have greater rewards in other words you got to be paid more there's got to be something more there they're saying from a functionalist this was the motivating for the qualified people to basically say they were that prestige type aspects or they had power or they had that property could kind of go along with it. But at the same time, you had Truman that kind of critiqued it and said, well, wait a minute, what about the mediocrity that kind of happens in there? You know, which is basically a form of a social stratification in which all positions are awarded on the basis of merit. So when you're looking at the aspects of that, you know, they, they kind of use the Williams sisters in regards to that. They used um, Michael Phelps as an example of that as well. It's just like, you know, they don't attempt to justify the social inequality in some of the aspects in regards to it. Um, you know, you have to have certain explanations as to why there's still social stratification. Um, is it really universal? Does it make uncomfortable decisions? Do we have to know why or, you know, why or why not certain things do? So they found out, you know, first, how do we know that the position that is being offered the highest reward are more important? what how do we prove that how do we know that just by the title or the, by the job opportunities or by the job description how do we know that's the actual aspects of that position and then second the stratification that Moore did described it that the society would be that mediocrity that the positions would have to be rewarded on the basis of merit but what is it do we have to serve as a merit what do we have to do to prove that those predictors, you know, by someone going to college, someone going to college to mean that they have the merit, and someone working in the field and having college, you know, what type of merits can it happen? So that's kind of where Truman and kind of critiqued the Davis and more kind of experiment in regards to it. And then third, he looked at it from, you know, they critiqued it as well as that. So if functional, it should be beneficial almost to everyone yet when we're looking at social stratification there's dysfunction for many because not everybody's working not everybody has the job opportunities to to be in those higher positions um just because you know uh someone's born in the slums doesn't mean they remain in the slums they always have to you know the opportunity to build and move around and get the education and to, you know move up that social class ladder so or there might be some mental disabilities or there might be some physical disabilities 
all of that wasn't taken in consideration when they looked at the function for society purposes in regards to for stratification purposes. So there's some positions that do require that more intense qualified positions, but what are the rewards really truly glorifying for that position type aspects? How do we know? <clears throat> well, we're looking at the first argument here. They argued in regards to, this is from a conflict perspective aspects, um, encountering class conflicts in the part of the resources. Um, underneath the first argument, in every society we, you know, will be stratified by power, right? No society can exist unless it's organized. Um, you have to have some type of leadership to coordinate people's actions. You got to have something in place in regards to it. Second, you have to have that leadership requires inequalities of power. By definition, some people lead while others follow. Lastly, human nature is self-centered. People in power will use their position to basically seize greater rewards for themselves first before they make sure anybody else gets those rewards. So that's kind of how the conflict aspects looked at it. Said, okay, well, I understand there's a function, but on the opposite side of things, this is just nature. The people are just gonna do this just because that's the way how it's supposed to be. When Mark's argument to that was, is that if we were alive to hear the functionalist argument, Marx would you know, basically be enraged in regards to the, the point of views that they kind of looked at and the power and that all that aspects. Um, Marx predicted that the, all the workers would kind of have this ideology that blinds them but one day, you know, class consciousness will kind of rip the blindfold off and kind of expose the truth. You know, we all have this, you know, we have to start at the bottom, work our way up. Well, in order to do that, we have to have goals and plans. So that's kind of how Marx's uh, argument in regards to class consciousness kind of came around. Like, you know, we, we're not always stuck in the, the situation we're in. We're able to move, off, move up and down in regards to the way how we need to. <clears throat> so from a functionalist, they believe that the stratification exists because it's the function for society, functional for society. From a conflict theorist, they stress that conflict, not function, is the reason why we have social stratification. Kind of sum that up for you a little bit. <clears throat> so kind of going back and forth in regards to, so once again, I'll repeat it again. Functionalists believe that stratification exists because of it is functional for society. And then when we're looking at conflict theorists, conflict theorists stress that conflict, not function, is the reason why we have social stratification. But when we're looking at how do we lead to maintain stratification, you know, but at the same time, when we're looking at function and conflict, I'll go back before I talk about this. When we're talking about function and conflict, um, Linsky had a synthesis in regards to it, saying, hey, well, you know what, hold on. If you see functionalists and conflict theories disagree sharply with one another, he suggests the surplus key, right? He basically said, you know, this is a thin synthesis, the views of the functionalists and conflicts. He's like, okay, well, here's a concept of surplus. And the surplus is just basically groups that don't accumulate a surplus, um, such as hunting gathering societies. These societies give the greater share to their resources. Um, if you think about us, you know, a surplus, we have a surplus of supplies and needs. Um, if one store doesn't have it, we go to another one. You know, our stuff gets shipped here to us. Uh, we don't have to go hunt and gather. We don't have to determine in regards to the um, climate and the ecosystem and stuff like that to make sure we get enough rainfall to make sure that we have enough nutrition that so that it's going to grow in order for our garden and for us to go get and, you know, our hunting purposes to make sure, you know, the environment does its thing in regards to, you know, the, the natural survivals of, you know, animals and stuff like that to kind of keep it going. Um, so that's kind of how Linsky kind of looked at that synthesis. He said, you know, we have to have this concept of surplus. It's a key. Um, because eventually if we run out of certain sources or if we run out of resources, then we're going to be in with a problem in regards to it. So how do we at least maintain the stratification? When we're looking at these main elites, they have this divine king of right type aspects, right? They have the aspects of controlling people's ideals. They're in charge. They're able to control those ideals. They're able to control information. They can say, you know, what they want to give out, what they don't want to give out, or what information they share, what, you know, what information they don't share. Um, they have the shuffling of criticism. Um, back in the, the old times history, the prior elites don't like to be criticized. Um, but if you got caught criticizing like a king or something like that, or even his dog, you know, you're basically sentenced to death type aspects. 
you you know they didn't deal with criticism the same you know the same way as some of our leaderships does now um criticism is you know controlled and it takes a little bit of my full uh, form in regards to the u.s defense now i mean we do get criticized a lot and we kind of deal with those aspects but at the same time you know no one likes to be criticized so it depends on how you handle it um, the big brother technology type aspects is the ideal. It's the preservation of the elites. This will allow citizens to be monitored without them even knowing that they're being monitored. We, we looked at this in chapter five in regards to the surveillance, you know, being able to identify somebody out of a group of a thousand. That's kind of like that same technology type aspects. It's, you know, we know we're being monitored. We're okay with it up to a certain extent, but we don't want to be going beyond that. <coughs> When we're looking at the aspects of um, stratification from like a social stratification in Great Britain, and social stratification from the former senior year union, when we look at it from a Great Britain type aspects, this is um, one of the countries that make up of basically the England type aspects, you know, Great Britain is it's one of the, the Scotland's and the Wales and all that type of aspects. These are like other industrial uh, countries, I'll spit that out, that have the population that's evenly divided in between lower, middle, and upper class. Um, they have their lower working class, they have their middle class, they have their upper class. Their, their tiny upper class is the wealthy, powerful, and highly educated that makes up about 1% of the population compared to the U.S. Um, it's you know a real big difference in regards to that really bad power elite but when you're looking at the education is a primary way in which british perpetuates the class system um, from one generation to the next um, almost all children go to the neighborhood schools but the richest five percent however who owned about half of the nation's wealth send their kids to the exclusive private boarding school type aspects so you can kind of see how that really shifts in regards to making sure you know, that class system stays in place. Um, when we're looking at former Soviet Union aspects, they kind of tweaked um, its social countries in regards to their, their triumph and in their equality, and they kind of point the finger at the glaring inequalities of the United States. Um, when they look at the disparities of privilege and stuff like that, they kind of made sure that their communist party wasn't too highly stratified, you know, stratified. Um, they wanted to make sure that their members occupied the, a low level where they fully fulfilled the task and, you know, spying on fellow workers type aspects, but they kind of made that leadership, you know, a little bit different in regards to making sure that social class kind of remains the same throughout, that there was really a big difference in regards to everybody. So their social stratification wasn't as severe in regards to the inequality that U.S. kind of looks at. We have basically three worlds. They're basically split into categories of nation. Um, this doesn't mean like one nation is superior than others. If these are just terms um, that do not imply value judgments about some parts of the world. They're just basically splitting it into a conceptual groups to make it sure that we kind of understand like how we look at this. So when we're looking at the most industrial nation, these are like US, Canada, North America type aspects, Great Britain, France, Germany, Switzerland. These are most industrialized nations. These are the you know nations that kind of own um, a little bit of land and have a big population type aspects, right? Um, we have more of the factory type aspects that are in there. So that's what makes us the most industrialized. When we're looking at like industrial nations, these are nations that include most of the nations like from, uh, former Soviet Union, um, the satellites in Eastern Europe type aspects. These are the nations that account for about 20% of the Earth's land and about 16% of the people's population. So, uh, you know, the aspects of dividing it, this is kind of like the middle ground. So it's like they have some categories of uh, factory type aspects, but they're not fully as like a most industrialized and they're not as a least industrialized category aspects. But when we're looking at least industrialized aspects, these are the ones that has the most land and the most population wise. Um, these are like small farms that or the little villagers within certain nations, right? Uh, large families, barely survival, barely any means to kind of keep things going. They depend on the land for their survival type aspects. 
Um, and then we have a modifying model in regards to which are those, those are the oils rich nations type of aspects. So when you're looking at most industrialized and know these three as being the kind of the three worlds global, but like I said, they're not to imply value judgments as some part of the world while splitting it into conceptual groups. These are just kind of breaking up into groups that makes it more sense. Know them as most industrialized, industrializing and least industrializing. But when you're looking at this, you can see the most industrialized, yes, we have land and we have a high population at the same time. When you're looking at an industrial nation, they have a little bit less land and a lot of population, but they're still, like I said, they still function on, a, on a aspects that there's some factories there that are just not as industrialized as like the US is. When you're looking at least industrialized, they have the most land and the most population, so they depend on their land for survival. They don't have the functions, the, the surplus of needs. You can kind of look at it that way. When you're looking at the global stratification of income wise, you can kind of see the most industrialized nation has a, a even flow. These are the ones through 27 and we'll see more when I flip the slide again. The least industri the industrializing, this is the, the bluish color. Your least industrialized nations are usually like right in here. But if you can see the income, I mean, when you're looking at the least industrialized nation, they also have the least amount of income. They're on there as well for a reason in regards to the least amount because there's not a lot of factories, not a lot of jobs. They work for the bare minimum aspects. So it's one of those situations to where we're looking at this, we can kind of see the inequality that happens globally. <clears throat> and like I said, I mentioned in regards to there's a new stratification that's kind of, kind of coming in, the new model, which is now in placing the oil riches nations. And those are the purple ones here. But if you can see, they have a wide range in regards to income wise. They have a high all the way down to a low. Your least industrialized nation kind of branches out a little bit more. You can see 151. Average income per person is about 400, you know, $400. It's not a whole lot, but you're talking a really least industrialized nation. And 151 is, I'm trying to find it on the map, um, right here, this area right here. The land-wise, there's a lot of land there, but if you notice, it's, it's on the sides. There's just no oil that's being produced out of there versus something that's right here or right in here or this little dot in here. 156, which is right here, which is Bahrain. You can kind of see their income's kind of middle of the road. If you look at 152, which is this little dot right here, you know, which is Quintar, a little bit different in regards to income. You know, when you're looking at the the aspects of oil, on um, the producing of aspects of oil, that's where the income kind of changes in regards to this oil rich nation aspects. So we're looking at global stratification in the third world. This is Brazil. We normally see Brazil as this lovely, gorgeous area in regards to um, a gorgeous area of water and retreat area, gorgeous place to to live. And, you know, unfortunately it is an industrialized nation. You know, life is cheap in the poor nations type aspects. Um, this is a mom with her two kids. I do believe she's pregnant with the third one, um, if you could tell in the picture. But this is their living arrangements. This is where they live. This is, you know, they're basically housing, very on the poor end side of things. You know, um, it wouldn't be something that would be appealing if you saw this on a, you know, visit Brazil type thing or anything like that. Um, so we talked about the four world certification, which is including the oils rich, non industrial, non industrialized nation. Colonialism aspects, colonialism. <clears throat> it's just uh, aspects in regards to the process by which one nation takes over another nation, usually in order to exploit its labor and natural resources. Um, but before I go, I'm going to go back to here. Keep in mind, this one right here is your least industrial. This is a category of nations that has the most land. I'll repeat it again, has the most land. And I need to know that. But when we're talking about colonialism. It's the process by which one nation takes over another, usually in order to exploit its labor of natural resources. That's just how we do it. We stress that 
countries have industrialized, they want to take over the least industrialized, so but they take over land if it's one of those lands that could be improved and be used for the purposes of gaining income type aspects, right? It's our, you know, we want to exploit the labor and natural resources out of that area. So it's usually done by wartime in that aspects. Or we're looking at world system theory. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have two ways to kind of look at uh, world system theory. We have the coordination and the periphery of our part of both are, are part of the, the world systems theory, which is how economic and political connections develop among nations, connecting that now link the world's countries together. You know, this is kind of like our trading system type aspects. If we don't communicate and trade, then we're kind of all function independently. We kind of have to work together as a world's nations to kind of bring things together. So it's kind of like the core, the periphery, it's a part in order to make things work. Um, if we lose our connections, we can end up with like globalization of capitalism type aspects, um, position of trades, you know, can kind of take out of control type thing. <clears throat> so when we're looking at globalization in regards to south of the border, this is someone who's working on GM card dashboards. Um, this is somebody who is assembling those. You know, on average, you're expecting a person to be making, you know, a couple hundred dollars a day working on electronic systems like this on, you know, electrical components on the dashboard. However, the pay is about a hundred dollars for a 48 hour work week. Um, it's about $2 an hour what it breaks down to. Because this is in Mexico, they don't have to pay them the normal wages that they would pay in the US. So we kind of have this, when we're evaluating the, the culture of poverty, our world system theories and stuff like that, we tend to make sure our culture of poverty is the assumption that the values and behaviors of the poor make them fundamentally different from the other people. But in this aspect, you're looking at the, the worker in this portion, you know, she's working, she's busting her butt, she's got the knowledge, and here she's putting, you know, dashboard harnesses for GM cars together, and she's making very, very little. But at the same time, here's the inside of a home of a worker that's in Mexico as well, which is completely on the culture of poverty aspects in regards to being on the really low end of quality of life, you know, poverty type aspects. You can kind of see how it's a little different in regards to how much is too much in regards to we're looking at politician type government aspects in regards to world system theory. You know, yes, we contract our stuff out sometimes, not as much anymore, but for the most part, when we did contract our stuff out, it was for, for that cheaper labor. However, the cheaper labor, it comes over here and it still gets priced up for a higher cost because it's in the U.S. So it's kind of one of those things to where it's the inequality of the, the world system kind of aspects. When we're looking at maintaining global stratification, we have a neocolonialism, which is the economic and political dominance of the of the uh, least industrial nation um, by the most industrial nation. Right, that that's a neocolonial. It's just basically that dominance control. <clears throat> when we're looking at the multinational corporations, these are the companies that operate across national boundaries, also called transnational corporations. These are basically U.S. corporations that run essentially American nations kind of all over the world type aspects. If you think about it, what type of companies that run globally? A lot of times you have blinks that run, banks that run globally. You have, you know, certain um, franchises that run globally. They may not run underneath the same name. You know, they might have a big corporation name and they might have, you know, our umbrella name and they might function or run as a different name. But for the most part, you have these big industrial companies that from a most industrialized area that end up getting put into a least industrialized nation type aspects. So you have multiple nation corporation going. Um, technology and global dynamics, you know, when we're looking at the race between the most and the least, obviously the most industrialized nation has this basically huge gap on a least industrialized nation. Um, it sky's the limit, whereas if you look underneath the least industrialized nation, a lot of those areas do not have like running water, electricity, just like in the beginning. You have very poor village type aspects that are living in those areas. That's um, a very different type of living. So it does put that strain on that global system. 
um, it counted as, as threatened failures or collapse, the historical shifts being um, disrupted kind of throughout all history. We have our ups and downs, we just kind of flow with them. Um, we're now living, we're living through such a time now to where, you know, sometimes we, we don't realize globally how inequality things are or how unequal things are. Um, if you look at a bigger picture on a you know social stratification level, we can kind of see throughout the history of time that those least industrial nations are still living in like the hunting, hunting and gathering type aspects to where they're not in a surplus of needs, like to where they could just go to the store and get whatever they want. They still struggle. They still have a hard time. They don't get the medicine or the they don't have the technology or they don't have the lifestyles to make things a little easier. So there's still some disruption in regards to those historical shifts in between most industrialized nations to the industrialized nations to the least industrialized nations. Um, this actually covers all of chapter seven. If you guys have any questions, feel free to email me.